the participants are joining in so we'll just uh, wait sure. So welcome all those who have joined. So we'll wait for a couple of minutes before we start the very interesting session on rock hard eye. And uh, we have really good speakers and very experienced surgeons with us. So it should be a nice session. So let's wait for a couple of this minutes. So is a and then uh, we'll join back. This is a 60 plus old lady. Okay, so I think uh, we are past seven and we'll start the webinar now. And uh, the topic of today is rock hard eye. And uh, definitely this is a, uh, I think fortunately a rare yes. complication, but uh, definitely something which uh, we should be aware of. Because uh, many times for young surgeons who have not uh, done you know, a lot of surgeries or not experience uh, uh, with a number of cases. This may not occur to you for a very long time, or this might be just a case on any other day. So for any difficulty, I feel, you know, it is best to know the things, th know the difficulties, know what you can anticipate from particular, you know, problem and knows how to get out of that, uh, you know, situation before you land in trouble. So I think for that, uh, we have invited very experienced surgeons, Dr. Nito Rosatelli. I think there is no need to introduce him. Amazing surgeon, done uh, not thousands, lakhs of cataracts from Brazil. 
and such a beautiful youtube channel he has and uh, i would recommend every young surgeon not just young but any ophthalmologist to just uh, join his youtube channel he has two of them and please join and just watch his surgeries the way he manages difficult cases as well as simple ones and uh, the second dr sunil tangraj i think amazing surgeon i was amazed by the variety of cases he does he does corneal surgeries he does glaucoma he does cataract and lot of these cases are very difficult very tricky uh, cases and he has his own youtube channel i think by his name and i think it's also a must watch for all surgeons and uh, there is no need to introduce me and dr deepak uh, dr deepak is excellent surgeon excellent educator and we too have started this uh, website fecotraining.org.in and you are welcome to also you know give your own videos to us so that we can edit we can review and we can publish on our website because this is for all of us to you know educate ourselves and it helps each of us very immensely uh, so with that brief introduction i will just start off because i know that uh, many of us uh, when we start our academics when we start doing surgeries many times we you know miss out on certain basics when we know certain basics i think we are uh, we can think about a particular situation in a different manner knowing the basics behind it so i will just share uh, the basics of what we are going to face a rock hard eye so let's start with that and then we'll have dr sunil's case so let's let me start with the basic first okay so when we face intraoperatively a rock hard eye by rock hard eye we mean it's so hard that we cannot you know put any instrument in it's like rock then we have particularly these two ent two entities which we have to think about the first one is the suprachoroidal hemorrhage where there is a bleeding in the suprachoroidal space which is causing very hard eye and second is the intraoperative aqueous misdirection so let's think about the second one first intraoperative aqueous misdirection or fluid misdirection and uh, you will find that you know even the malignant glaucoma is aqueous misdirection and there was this paper which suggested that acute intraoperative aqueous misdirection behaves similarly to a malignant glaucoma but the difference is that it is acute that means it is happening right on table and the reason behind this is that the fluid is passing through the leaky zonules into the burgeous space and then it is hydrating the vitreous so much that now the eye starts pushing everything out so it is a outside in phenomena that's what i you know call it because you are pushing some fluid in which is hydrating the vitreous which is getting accumulated in the burgeous space raising the intraocular pressure and now it starts pushing everything out so remember this is a outside in phenomena this is because of something going in from outside well the second is the suprachoroidal hemorrhage now this is something we have to be even more careful about this happens because you know the basic architecture or the basic vascularity of the eye there are posterior ciliary arteries and there are short ciliary arteries which are supplying the anterior part of the eye and they pass through this suprachoroidal space now because of certain factors which will i will uh, add later these vessel these arteries they break and they break and they start bleeding torrentially in that suprachoroidal space so initially it might be very small suprachoroidal hemorrhage which may start pushing or the vitreous gel or intraocular contents anteriorly it will start pushing the iris lens everything anteriorly and if you cannot control it then it becomes the expulsive choroidal hemorrhage that means everything is being expelled out so that's how it uh, that's how it happens so i call it inside out phenomena that means there is something which is happening inside the eye you are not pushing it from outside it is happening because the choroidal space or i would say the choroidal volume itself is increasing and increasing very rapidly so that's the reason why this happens so uh, before we move on to risk factors which uh, i would like even the uh, 
uh, experienced panelists to you know sp speak about when if they had any particular experience. I will just add these two particular physiological you know facts which we must think about when we are tackling this situation. So many of us are aware of our blood pressure. Okay, so our blood pressure has a systolic and the diastolic pressure, and there is a mean arterial pressure. Okay, so there is a formula for calculating the mean arterial pressure, which is written on this slide. So for a normal person with say 120-80 uh, blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure is say around 93. Of course, when the patient's blood pressure is high, the mean arterial pressure is going to rise. And the ciliary artery perfusion pressure, according to the physiological studies, is 50% that of mean arterial pressure. So obviously, if the mean arterial pressure systemic is say 93, then the ciliary artery perfusion pressure will be 45. Okay, so what's the meaning of this? So suppose intraoperatively patients mean arterial pressure has uh, increased. So say 110 or 120, then ciliary artery perfusion pressure is going to be 60. And now if these vessels start bleeding, if you want to control that, you need counter pressure of equal amount. So if you have 60 ciliary arterial pressure and if you want to close that bleed, you have to pressurize the eye with equal amount of pressure. Okay, so that's one thing we should understand. Second thing is bleeding time. So it is not just the pressure, but the time duration for which you should stop because the normal bleeding time is say two to seven minutes. Now, if you just put pressure for one minute and just release it, it's of no use because there has not, it has not started formation of the platelet plugs or it's not start, stopped bleeding. So it will again start bleeding torrentially. So I think this is something we should know about the physiology. And another fact is that whenever there is a clot, so there has been bleeding and a clot has formed now, the clot lysis occurs roughly at 14 days according to the uh, various studies. But we can say that it starts, of course, that is the complete lysis, but partial lysis can start early. So normally for release of this supracoridal bleed, we, stop, uh, we wait for at least one week, seven days to 14 days, and then we can release this clot. So I think this clot lysis time is also important for management and for the thinking behind this problem. So let's see at some of the risk factors. So now when we see the entire scenario, there are systemic risk factors which are mainly causing, as I said, either raise mean arterial pressure because of hypertension, tachycardia, or it may be weak vessel walls, like in case of advanced stage with atherosclerosis, which can cause bleeding. Also patients on anticoagulants, because even minimal bleed will lead to massive bleed. Now, what are the ocular problems? And we'll think about it more because we are going to face this. So for young surgeons, I think we should know this. Any patient with glaucoma and particularly high preoperative IOP, so like uncontrolled intraocular pressure, these patients are going to have high risk of these events. Fellow eye also suffers similar problem. Obviously, patient has systemic as well as ocular risk factor similar and axial myopia, two long eyes. And intraoperatively, I think this is something, you know, the experienced surgeons will vouch about. Whenever you have a large incision like the extracapsular extraction, you are going to be uh, you. You are going to put that eye at higher risk for these complications. Also, the sudden hypotony. So, whenever we are doing say small incision cataract surgery or FACO, you are avoiding the large incision. We are giving a self sealing incision, and that's why in the modern times we are seeing these complications rarer as compared to the maybe previous times. While selva maneuver, I think this is very important. Many times we miss it. Like you may have an obese patient lying down on your table, not able to breathe, patient holds breathe, or patient is apprehensive. I think uh, Dr. Nito or Dr. Sunil, you must have had certain experience because many of these factors, we see a lot of patients preoperatively, we check them all and intraoperatively patients might behave a little differently. Any experience with these? Dr. Nito, you can unmute, yes. Yes. Um... Thank you, Sura. I think what you just said about the Valsalva uh, problem is it's, it's a very, it's a, 
it's a very big problem in obese patients. Sometimes just uh, from moving on the table or getting a, a better position on the table during surgery, they apply too much force in their abdomen and valsalva is very big. So it's, uh, it's something that uh, beginner surgeons should uh, have in mind when operating these patients to have this under control. And I think uh, large incision surgeries uh, are a very, uh, are at very high risk of developing in, uh, interoperative supercordial hemorrhage in such cases. So it's very important to be aware of that. And sometimes if you suspect, as you said, if the patient has had uh, a interoperative hemorrhage in the fellow eye and you're operating the other one, be ready, have sutures ready to, uh, to act if this happens. You don't have time to wait for sutures to come to close the eye and everything. So you have to be prepared. Yes. Any, any additional experience, Dr. Sunil? Uh, sort of, yes. Other than the bull neck, the obese patient, the position of the patient is very, very important. Many times uh, we do not realize uh, the head head position should always be above, mm. above the heart. But at the same time, you maintain that horizontal level to the microscope. Many of these obese patients, because of their, you know, of their physical nature, the head is right down, bringing the heart at a higher level. And this can put a lot of pressure, a lot of arterial pressure. And these, these are small things that you have to look at every right. time. So make sure that the patient is comfortable, put him in a comfortable position, and make sure about the head position is very, very important. And uh, most of the time, if you look at your if you look at your cases, it is these obese patients who actually have problems. Yeah. Any additional thing, Dr. Deepak, you'd like to add? Uh, I think when you are uh, regarding the hypotony, so I think I would like to add that you know sudden hypotony has to be avoided. Like you know when you're yes. operating on a uh, phacomorphic glaucoma or the patients who have a high intraocular pressure, especially advanced HP. Rather than going full through and through, I think with your side port or whatever, you can use just a 26 number needle first initially to decompress it just a little partially. Yes, so yes. slow decompression is extremely critical when you're operating on patients who are uh, having high intraocular pressure. Although we use all IV manitol, everything preoperatively, I think avoiding sudden hypotony is extremely right. because the first instrument which goes into is the side port instrument itself. We're doing side ports. Usually there's a first. Most okay. of us do like that. So instead of using a regular side port blade, I would recommend to use maybe a needle or even if using a side port blade, just grow very gradually. Just decompress a little bit. Very Then that's, that's the first step which really sets it on. The entire process is just sets it on. Domino's yeah. effect. You have to be very careful with this. And regarding this, I would like to add a point Choroidal circulation has very interesting physiology. I think it is auto-regulated circulation. So okay. that's why whenever you create sudden hypotony, you know, the vessels are going to become big. Okay. That's what we see in thysicle eyes. You know, when there is a hypotony, the choroid, you know, thickens because it is auto-regulated. When the pressure is high, the choroid thins out and the vessels become thin. So I think that's why you can imagine when you are operating that eye is under pressure. So you have to release it slow. So the autoregulation takes its time. You know, slowly the vessels will come back to the position they want. Another thing which I have noted is like many times we have patients with high intraocular pressure and we give them IV mannitol pre-op. And then when you, you are going to plan the surgery, this happens that now patient wants to void urine yeah, because the bladder is full. And so after you give IV mannitol, I think it is must that before patient comes to operating room, patient should go and void urine. Otherwise, no, many, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, many my, my rule is most of them are elderly men who have got prostate problems. They come with the LIG4 with me. So three times going to the washroom is compulsory after IV mannitol. Three <laughs> times. I think so that's, that's a rule. That's yeah. a rule which we follow. <laughs> and because many times patient don't tell you what the problem is, but they are, you know, holding their urine and that creates again like valsalva like thing they are holding breath and causing so uh, we have faced this so i think for young surgeons it's a uh, good point that whenever you give ivmentol let the patient you know void urine and before he comes to it. 
ओके सो आई थिंक अबाउट द डूज एंड डोंट्स exactly you know according to how we are thinking about the problem similarly we have to think about do's and don'ts so as dr nito has already pointed out you have to seal the incision well you have to also another point that many times we miss uh, as uh, dr sunil was saying patient may be uncomfortable because of something it may be position it may be because of anesthesia also like patient is having some pain patient is uncomfortable and patient starts getting agitated so i think we have to think about that also at that time because otherwise patient will land up in trouble reverse trendlenburg as i think dr sunil has rightly pointed out the position you know so if there is a you know starting of supracordial you should do other way around like take the head up i think uh, that's very important and also iv manitol on table that to reduce the iop and what we should not do is doing any additional step so i think we'll think about it when we Uh, start seeing the cases and uh, place and do okay so i with that i will just stop the uh, discussion and uh, i will start with the first case so okay there is uh, one question by the time i share the video you can answer what is the time gap between manitol and taking that patient to the ot yeah Doctor Deepak. Yeah, yeah. So once the manitol is stopped, once it is turned off, I usually give a time of twenty minutes to thirty minutes. So before we shift the patient to the OR, that's the time we use it to for him to go visit the washroom at least twice, minimum of twice, two to three times. Okay. And what is the time manitol takes its effect generally? Like we wait uh, for thirty minutes, forty minutes. Yeah, it, I think it's the effect is between from I don't remember exactly okay. anywhere between thirty minutes to maybe one and a half minutes. minutes. Okay. Or, yeah, yeah, something like that. And uh, do you like repeat it in between? Like for example, if you feel on table again, patient has high IOP. So no, you... I have not done it uh, in my. No, I have okay. never done it so far. But it's a recommended practice. Few of the uh, older generation surgeons used to keep an IV manitol ready in the OT table itself in the event okay. of such a thing to happen. But yeah. I haven't used it in my career. Okay. Sort of just one point. Yes. One point here. Many people give a very small bolus of mannitol, thinking that it will work. It doesn't work that way. You cannot give 30, 40 ml and expect it to work. You have to give the dose according to the body weight. Just an important point to remember. Yeah, perfect. I think that answers the question. So five cc per body weight. I think per kg is uh, has to be administered. Uh, okay, so we'll start off with the first case uh, by Dr. Sunil, and here it goes. This is a 60-plus old lady who came with complaints of pain and defective vision in the right eye. She had a pressure of 48. She was treated elsewhere for a prolonged period of time. The history is extremely unreliable. On clinical examination, we decided that it is a lens-induced glaucoma, either. it is an uncontrolled angle closure glaucoma or it was an anterior subluxation of the lens either way we came to the conclusion that it was the lens that was the offending factor and since there was a significant cataract as well decided to go ahead and remove the lens we thought we could handle if at all there was a later on glaucoma we could handle that at a later stage so right now we we are only handling the lens since the cornea was hazy i decided go ahead and do a transconjunctival small incision cataract surgery rather than a phaco emulsification and the the uh, wound has been very very well fashioned and this came to great use later on as you will see fashioning the scleral pockets and that's a really good done then go ahead to my side port enter the anterior chamber with my keratome do not extend at this point in time fill the anterior chamber with air and that is a really good fill as you can see stain the capsule with trypan blue and expel both the air and the trypan blue with 2% hpmc i then go ahead and start fashioning my capsular excess i usually make a large capsular excess with my bent 26 gauge needle in all small incision cataract surgery please notice how the patient is moving a bit it did not get my attention it only mm -hmm. later on when i saw the video did i realize that 
anyway that's my rexus all going well no problem at all now i am just going ahead and increasing the opening up my incision and i can see the viscoelastic coming out this is not normal slowly the eye is shallowing although i am not so concerned but once i start putting in my hydro dissection you can see how much it's shallowed the definitely the anterior chamber has shallowed and definitely the intraocular pressure is getting high i know there is a problem how i can still put in some visco you can see it it's not easy to fill it is really becoming rock hard there i can make out the pressure is really high i anyway decide let me go ahead and remove the nucleus if i can so i just uh, cartwheel the nucleus my usual way the two sinski hooks i try to sandwich and bring it out and put posterior scleral pressure but no way at this time maybe some would say i should have abandoned but i didn't i went ahead put in some viscoelastic i need to get this nucleus out i don't want it hanging around against the endothelium put in a vectus and brought out the nucleus i then tried to take out some cortex but it has become extremely difficult the chamber has completely shallowed and now it is becoming extremely dangerous to do anything patient is also complaining of pain has been complaining in fact so i managed to take out some of the sub parasynthesis cortex but you can see the pc tenting up and i am not even able to go in through the uh, side port with ease i try once again but this is now becoming a futile exercise it's becoming very difficult i just put in some viscoelastic and decide there is either an aqueous misdirection or there is a supracoroidal hemorrhage the globe is extremely hard and i decide the best option for me now is to just abandon the surgery and have a look at the patient uh, the next day and then decide what to do sorry so uh, we are on mute yeah i was muted so uh, uh, at this juncture i just paused and i would like to know uh, uh, dr sunil's thought process during the whole sequence of events because you know right now we can just uh, you know coolly sit in front of our laptop and watch all the video but i think the surgeon is facing a lot of different thoughts when he is actually operating such a tough case so what were you thinking and how did you come to the conclusion of stopping that surgery at that point see initially this is the problem and this is a infallible thing you always think you know the worst is not in, it cannot be happening to me you know and you just think it is some other cause of positive vitreous pressure maybe incomplete ikinesia maybe something else i can manage you know and that is what made me actually bring the nucleus out of the bag now once i brought it out of the bag there was no go for me but to bring it out i can't leave it against the cornea uh, there but it is at that time and the other uh, other problem was i did not pay attention to the patient's complaint of pain and when the patient was moving so much you know I, agreed i do get some patients who are a little fussy but most of them are not they are very cooperative and i did not pay attention to that and it is only when i actually started when i realized i could not break because that was a pretty large incision small not that big a nucleus it could have easily come out from that and but it was not coming out so obviously it was being pushed up so i mean the pressure was too much i already tested it with my visco cannula so i knew now i can't kid myself any more it is either a misdirection or it's a supracoroidal and given the sequence of pain and all the sequence that was unfortunately i thought it is more in favor of a supracoroidal and i think it was it would have been in the best interest of the patient and in my interest to abandon and luckily i did 
and uh, uh, I think did start uh, uh, before you pushed any fluid in the eye. I think. I think after harder hydro dissection, right? Yeah. No, yeah. when I when I was trying to do the hydro dissection, yeah. you know, it actually shallowed when I opened the incision. Okay. And I mentioned, in fact, the viscose started coming out. Mm. The hydro dissection was almost impossible. If you look at my cannula, it was going against the iris. I could not even go. I somehow managed to go and do, and luckily the nucleus came out. Okay, so there was. Uh, I mean, I was lucky to get that plane, but I definitely did not, you know, hydro dissect over the capsule. I was very much aware yeah. that it is a shallow. You see, I have to go in the correct plane. Yeah, there was no I, no way I could have, you know. I think uh, gone into the wrong plane. Yeah. I think it started even before you uh, did CCC. Like I think the it started shallowing the moment you made the incision. That's what uh, I think you saw. The moment I expanded the incision. incision. When okay. I made the incision and put in the air, it was a good <laughs> fill, no okay. problem. Okay. Doctor Nito, you would like to add some few things? No. Okay, we. Uh, I think we have. We have lost the connection. Say like that, Dr. Nito. Before hydro dissection. I think there is some issue with the net. Uh, Deepak, you can. Yeah, in the meanwhile, there's a yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a question for Dr. Sunil. Uh, was it done under topical anesthesia? What anesthesia were you using? No, 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 no. This was under peribulbar. I never do SICS under topical. I'm I'm a fan okay, of peribulbar fine. anyway. So, so it was uh, under my question. Yeah. My question was, uh, what was the status of the other eye, uh, and uh, what is the status of the other eye, and also the pre-operative, like you know, uh, gonioscopy or something was done, the intraocular pressure measurement. What was the pressures in the gonioscopy or something? You had any idea about this? And what is the status of the other eye, in this patient? Yeah, the gonio. See the gonioscopy in the right eye, in the eye that I operated. Okay, I could not see the angle too well. Okay. But the other eye, the angle was great too. It was open. Okay. And uh, you could say, but she was, see, at the same time, she came with a pressure of 48. Yeah. The pupil was slightly constricted. The, Unlike your, your diagnosis... angle closure, but she was also having treatment elsewhere, which we do not know what drops she was on. She might have been on pilocarpine. I do not know. I have no idea. But all that I could see in her hand was diamox. Yes. Okay. So she was having some treatment elsewhere. And so, uh, because of a few other problems with the ECG, we had to send her for uh, clearance. And she came back only after a week. And then the pressure was around 58 or something. So we had took her up for surgery. And you could see even in the surgery, the cornea was all steamed up. So it's like yes. a high pressure. And it was not controlled with medication. Yes. So it could I, be an uh, angle closure, definitely. Yeah, that's it's probably right. my, an angle closure. My, my and, thought was uh, like that. It's an angle closure eye. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, after manitol, did you check the pressure before shifting the uh, patient to the OR? No, we did not check okay. the okay. pressure after manitol. So I don't like to put anything on the cornea at that time. It's okay. just uh, something that we do. So uh, we just took her up. Uh, Dr. Nito, we lost uh, you in between. So can you repeat what you said? Uh, yes, yeah, I dropped out. Sorry. And uh, no, it's. Uh, I think the main thing to consider to make the diagnosis was that the the eye became pressurized. You, know, it was there was posterior pressure coming up even before hydro dissection was done. So uh, this really speaks in favor of a supracordial hemorrhage. Yeah, and uh, now we'll start the rest part of the video. But before we start, I think uh, excellent demonstration by Dr. Sunil what to do in such situation. He stopped the surgery. I, and I think for, need, for this, he needs to be applauded because, you know, this is what any surgeon should do at that point. I think <coughs> that is a very important take-home message. And we'll see how Dr. Sunil managed the case further so i will start the next part of the video now so i have abandoned the surgery mind you preoperatively i have given this patient manitol 
on the post of day one look at the, the ac is very well formed there is cortex there is some epithelial edema but the ac is extremely well formed in fact it's deep i did an ultrasound and i could not see any collection and so i went ahead on that same day due to logistic reasons or whatever reasons thought i could just take out the cortex in a jiffy and put in the lens and be done with it so the cortical aspiration took me just a few seconds hardly any time there was no problem so took out all the inferior cortex you can see chamber is well formed everything going on well went in through the side port to take out the subincisional cortex all out no problem but once i started attempting this now the it was like a rerun of the previous day the ac flattened the eye became hard i pushed the lens half way through i can see the tenting up of the pc now there is no no way i can abandon this i can't push this through the main incision so i just put in some viscoelastic over the iol and then decide go from the side port and dial this uh, iol the bag everything is intact so i'm not so worried but it is so difficult to do it and believe me i have been extremely extremely gentle over i do not know if there is and once i have done this just watch this i even release the lower haptic i thought okay let me take out the viscoelastic and that free cortex and this was you can see that surge and i suddenly saw the posterior capsule give way and almost the phonics the capsule of phonics come into view under the iol and probably there was a vitreous prolapse and now i have to rethink what to do so i went in with my side port and trying to check whether there is any vitreous there i'm not able to really make out if there is vitreous there i could pull the iris over the lens decided okay let me take out this viscoelastic and look at that severe undulation of the iris still the chamber is formed and the eye is not exactly hard at this time so what is going on and the patient is complaining of pain again has been complaining again we frequently ignore these signs although the pupil is round i suspect there is vitreous in the chamber so i put in some triams in alone this is the best time to do it because the chamber is not yet rock hard i have stained the entire chamber and look at the amount of vitreous that is there it is even prolapsed out of the side port i cannot leave this in the chamber so since there is a uh, slightly formed ac i go ahead and do a vitrectomy very 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 carefully you can see I'm just trying to take out and it is actually collapsing but reforming very fast at the same time and this is scary so there is there are a few fibers i just want to see if i can manage can the chamber is collapsing too much on me so i put in an ac maintainer and manage to do the vitrectomy of those few strands on the vitreous very carefully and this is where my wound has helped me so much if that wound was leaking believe me you just cannot do any of these so anyway now i have decided to quit while i am ahead put in some hair looks okay hydrated my wounds checking my main wound to see if there are any vitreous strands there very important there are none decided yes okay let's get out now and i conclude the surgery 
The next day post up there is some corneal edema but the anterior chamber is again really well formed. The IOL is in place and surprising the vision is 624 and with pinhole it's 612. And I was really thankful that I could manage this case. And I saw her three days later. And it is even better. The vision was 69. The intraocular pressure is well controlled. The IOL is well in place. There is no vitreous in the chamber. And I did an indirect ophthalmoscopy. It looks pretty normal. And all's well that ends well. But I had a torrid type. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. So I think uh, over to Dr. Nito. Uh, well, Sunil, I think what was a great asset for you was your incision because it was um, very self-sealing, a very well-constructed incision. And as you said, if you if it were it wasn't, you would be in great trouble trying to contain that. So. It's a, it's a very important thing that, and, and well, I, it's kind of puzzling to, to see the second uh, day of operation. It, it, it's. Well, I think we lost him again, I think. Uh, Dr. Deepak. Yeah. Uh, I think hats off to you uh, for, you know, your calmness and all this thing, because uh, intraoperatively, when you're, when you're sitting in the position in surgeon's chair, it's not easy to diagnose. You know, you, it's not, your mind is very clear, clumsy and Anything thought process is very... Profound or, or looking at the, the, the fundus. So I don't, I, I, I don't know how to explain that. It's been said that uh, anteriorly placed uh, hemorrhage, you can see very well in the ultrasound. I would like to know the other particip participants experiencing on that. <coughs> Okay, I think uh, we lost you, Dr. Nito, in between. But uh, yeah. I think what uh, question you asked was anterior uh, supracoronal hemorrhage. You can see with UVM. Is that uh, what you? Yeah, like? yeah, yeah. The 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 security of diagnosing this with the ultrasound in a so at a, at a so early stage. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, can you diagnose with the regular B scan that we have early supracordial hemorrhage? Because I think this was a case where the supracordial hemorrhage just aborted. That means it stopped because uh, Dr. Sunil stopped the case in the on the first day. So it just stopped there. So it might have been a little bit. So I was just reading about this. And uh, what it was given is that if you see the choroid, even if the thickness increases by 50 microliter of the choroid, the IOP can raise, you know, uh, increase to say 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury. So it might be very small collection of blood, which was enough for the pressure to, you know, rise. Because as I said, initially, it's an inside out phenomenon. You know, the eyes, the vitreous is getting compressed by li even little bit of blood, which is accumulating there. So... Uh, as uh, Dr. Sunil, he had done, I think, B scan postoperatively, but he could not see any collection. Is that right, Dr. Sunil? Yes, <clears throat> it was right. But you have to understand, I'm doing the B scan on the first post op day. Yeah, so you are. So, you know, I'm not going to be too aggressive about it. Yeah. Yes, and probably Dr. Nato is right. You know, I, I saw that the B scan, okay, there's no collection. And <clears throat> I got a little confident about the AC reforming. And then you <clears throat> use other reasons. Oh, what do I tell this patient? Can I send her back with cortex? Mm. What do I tell the relatives? So you, yeah. I took her the next day. Probably in retrospect, that was not such a great idea. Probably should have delayed it much more than that. <clears throat> but you know, you know, it's easy to tell here. We do this, we do that. Actual, actually, when we are faced with the patient, it's totally different. Yeah. But I think you were thinking that, you know, because there is no collection uh, on ultrasound and the IDO yes. also was really clear, you were thinking more, it's, it could be just a bit misdirection. Yes. In the first instance. <clears throat> That's right. I, I'm sure that you are not convinced that it was a supercoronal hemorrhage. That's the yes. reason why you took it on the next day. If you're convinced, yes. uh, then you would not have ventured to take it on the next no, day. No, no way. No Absolutely. way. <laughs> so that is the reason why you thought about it. Yeah. 
and, and the second uh, day also i think you know uh, once the victory started to come second second yes. when you intervened what was you thinking about uh, were you still thinking it is possibility of a wind misdirection or now the bells were ringing that you know maybe it could be supra corona because second time you have been absolutely yes. careful spontaneously the entire vitreous yes. is coming transzonularly it is just coming out across yes. the capsular fornix exactly and that should have rung your bell something else because you continued with your vitrectomy hindsight yes. that you would have stopped you should have just stopped you got a great self sealing incision just stop and come out and have mm-hmm. a chill you have ventured and thankfully nothing happened and then it was all right yes. okay that's <laughs> right that's spontaneously it is coming out if i was there in a situation my thought process would be why it is coming and the when you just saw in the slit lamp i is soft i'm sure you check the pressure when it is very soft chamber is well formed yes. you just dial the lens into the back and vitreous is spontaneously coming across the news then something else is the matter now should i continue yes. to do vitrectomy now or should i come off because you have a self sealed wound nothing you to do just come out vitreous yes. is there you can take it after 15 days no problem Exactly. This and is where the thought didn't come to you. I think, uh, Doctor Deepak, you know, this is why his video is so important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if I was in his place, I would have uh, definitely done worse with that eye. Yeah, ab- no, everybody would have done. We would have done still worse. That's why I'm telling you, complimenting that his common sense, uh, thinking yeah, process, right. but because his thought was still a fluid misdirection. Yeah, he was still exactly. thinking fluid misdirection. He was still yes. thinking that was the reason. because and, you know supracranial hemorrhage is so rare i haven't seen in my life most of them now we just think it's yeah. not that that is what this case teaches us this case is so important that you know you you can't be always so lucky you can't yes. be always so lucky that's what is my this thing would exactly be. yeah, yeah. Like, that is why i put the video's name as lightning strikes twice <laughs> how often just, does that happen yeah. absolutely <laughs> and you know the vitreous coming up you remember my second diagnosis was maybe a, some zonular diasms or subluxation yeah, so that yeah. is also going on uh, yeah. that's also going on in my mind whether you know there was because, a zonular diasms yeah. there because we find that the lens might be anteriorly mm-hmm. subluxated yeah. like weak zonules in patient with angle closure like it may be because of the loose zone and yeah, one more i think possible. one more important thing which uh, we should learn about his vitrectomy like when he saw that well with doing vitrectomy he was having trouble with the pressure you know the ac he added a anterior chamber maintainer i think i think that step uh, i think he was really thinking hard how to maintain the anterior chamber and do a uh, vitrectomy properly i think that was also a very nice step which helped him to uh, you know get through that vitrectomy so i think like uh, not every surgeon will think of putting a anterior chamber maintainer you know to compress the anterior chamber so i think that might have stopped the supracranial hemorrhage from progressing further yeah the only thing sunil i think you should have put the ac maintainer in the first instance exactly the, the, the corneal dimple and then you yes. put the ac maintainer yes We, i think otherwise it was a fantastic job what you did and uh, that's the reason why you are lucky second time lucky yes <laughs> exactly and i specifically put up this video is very controversial i mean looking back you can think of 100 things absolutely but i wanted to put this video because i want you know people to learn if not from my is no point in putting just you know your fantastic surgeries you should put your complications also and i think people learn more from your complications than anything else no yeah. it was really great you know it's such these are all such rare instances and uh, um uh, because you if you are aware of these things at least the mind starts thinking you know yes always the best thing would be to just abandon I, always yes. you did wonderfully well the first day and the, as nito was telling the crit has to go to the scleral tunnel we underrate our uh, small incision yes. scleral tunnel the value is understood exactly. in such cases it is such a great innovation it's such a great innovation its value ha- can be understood in such scenarios okay uh, dr deepak i think you can uh, start sharing your video in the meanwhile there is a question about uh, you know why not pass prana vitrectomy to manage a case and uh, we'll talk about it uh, very extensively in the last video of the session so you know and it will be very interesting uh, discussion what can go right or wrong uh, during pass prana vitrectomy so over to deepak i think he is yeah. going to show some interesting uh, scenarios he has faced so deepak over to you yeah yeah I think uh, I'll be speaking again. I'll be sharing my experience of intraoperative hard eye uh, syndrome. I've got uh, uh, more more than a couple of <laughs> cases. 
So this is one such case, routine fake emulsification, nothing unusual, extremely routine. You have a well dilated pupil and the nucleus is just uh, done here. And I'm just going to have to uh, take care of the cortex and wash uh, and put the lens in. That's what I'm trying to do now. So the last fragment is out here. And now, I, you, this is my usual practice. I start to just flush the PC. You can see the iris starts to come out here suddenly. The iris is just trying to come in now. So I still, I think nothing is just unusual. Maybe some in, issue with the incision. I just put in some viscoelastic and then uh, I try to go ahead. But the PC is literally bulging at me now. Okay, what I'm I trying to do uh, uh, by manual I and A, I can see that the PC is bulging. I'm scared to go inside. So what I do, go in, put HPMC now. That will deepen it a little bit. And then uh, again, I see, again, before I enter, the PC has again bulged forward. Again, I can't do it. I'm just trying to see something is wrong here. What is wrong? You can see the pressure is increasing. The iris is trying to come out from everywhere. Still, no, nothing is wrong. And I'm putting sodium alanate. You can look at the amount of uh, viscoelastic which just comes out of the side port. Okay, now I'm putting sodium, sodium alanate to deepen the bag. You can see everything is being pushed out rather than staying inside. But because the sodium alanate is there, it's much more heavier. I can <clears> do some amount of uh, cortex aspiration here. But again, you know, my it is all touching the cornea. Still, it is touching the cornea. It is so close to this thing. I've uh, ripped off part of an endothelium here. And every time the cortex is uh, uh, pulled it, and again, I'm going, I have to replenish it with viscoelastic and then do it. Uh, I know that something is wrong, but I thought the case is almost over. Just me putting the lens and begin, because the red glow is very good. I'm thinking that it could be just a, a fluid misdirection, which has happened. The fluid has gone across the zonules. And at every uh, uh, instance, I just go in, put in the viscoelastic and then remove the cortex. So finally, I could do that. And now I'm, my plan is to do the uh, lens insertion. You can see the OVD is coming out more than anything else. It's coming out from uh, the main incision. Actually, the wound is quite well constructed here. I am now I'm using dispersive OVD just to flatten it and press the lower lip so that it comes out. And dispersive OVD makes it look, you know, just settle the iris, settle down. I still think nothing is wrong here. I'm trying to put in a lens. Unfortunately, the lens is a multi-piece lens here. And at that time, the PC has come totally forward. My uh, injector is touching the probe here, uh, the cornea. The uh, cartridge is touching the cornea here. There's absolutely no space. And at this uh, time, I think better sense prevailed at me. I said, we'll just stop it. I'm to my fighting, I'm seeing some amount of uh, bleeding happening at the root of the iris. Maybe it is from the incision. I don't know. I just do in uh, high port uh, uh, hydration and I just postpone the surgery. This happened to be the second or third case of my list. So I postponed the surgery and sent it to uh, uh, the thing just to do the B scan in the indirect ethnoscopy. My colleagues uh, did the B scan. And then my thought process during this process was initially. Is it a minor issue like a, a tight uh, speculum or external pressure on the globe or is it a serious issue? Am I dealing with a supracoral hemorrhage or an, a fluid misdirection? Uh, I wasn't sure uh, but about this, but I once I did the indirect oscilloscopy and B-scan, got it done. Uh, there was no evidence of any uh, bleeding in the choroid or something. So we asked the, uh, our attendants to give in and it all. I made a diagnosis of uh, intraoperative fluid misdirection because it started after the fake emulsification process, because some amount of fluid had already gone into the eye. So that's my logic here. And two hours later, when uh, I was still in the OR, and I rescheduled the patient here, and the eye is soft now. Uh, you can see when I'm putting the viscoelastic, it's not coming out, it's staying inside. So this is something uh, which was uh, reassuring for me. And then I implanted the original planned multi-piece lens into the eye. And uh, thankfully, it went on well. And uh, based on these things, two things. One, the onset of the shallowing of the chamber, the globe becoming hard, was relatively delayed. It was after some amount of fluid had gone into the eye, after the fake emulsification has completed. That gave me a probably hint that I may be dealing with just an intraoperative uh, fluid misdirection. And uh, uh, luckily, the, uh, everything went off well. The patient did uh, uh, quite well. And the next day, the, the AC was formed, the, the pressures were normal, and uh, <laughs> the patient had some amount of coronal edema because of the endothelial damage which was there, but it's all right. 
this is another second case. This was something of an expected, much more easier to diagnose. This was, I was doing a case of a phacomorphic glaucoma. Preoperatively, we had this patient and she was treated medically. And uh, before taking to the surgery, obviously, mannitol was started in this patient. And uh, we do check the pressure just before the surgery is done uh, with eye care tonometer. And uh, the pressure was eight and it was documented here. And I begin my surgery. I tapped the eye and saw the eye was soft here. And uh, these were the, the challenges because at that time, I'm not thinking of something else. I'm thinking the surgery is going to be difficult because of uh, other issues here. As soon as make a first uh, 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 side port incision, uh, the AC does shallow. Or the AC was still very shallow before I started the procedure itself. But uh, as soon as I start injecting the uh, air and the dye, and suddenly it became a little bit more harder. So once I, I go back and irrigate the dye with saline here, again, this also the reason why probably it has gone into the, the fluid has entered in the posterior chamber a little bit. I'm still not thinking about it. I just wash it uh, and uh, I want to restain it multiple because the staining was not right. Uh, again, stain and then wash it with the uh, BSS. Uh, this surgery was being done under posterior subtenance anesthesia. Uh, I'm trying to uh, inject Kohe whisk now, that is the sodium hyaluronate, and to find out. And as soon as I do this, uh, I just wanted to dilate it and inject it some of it below the pupil. And then suddenly, as I enter, the AC again becomes uh, extremely shallow here. And the AC has become so shallow that uh, I'm unable to introduce my forceps to do the rexus here. And at the same time, the eyeball has become hard. So again, I thought it's a fluid misdirection. So I wait, I wait for maybe five minutes here just to ensure that it just redistributes, the fluid just redistributes. I just wait, just put viscoelastic and wait for a couple of minutes to hoping that it's going to be uh, soft and it doesn't. Then I thought uh, because uh, this was a case which was prone for this, uh, phacomorphic glaucoma, pseudo exfoliation, weak zonules, the viscoelastic and the fluid would have traversed behind the lens into the retroretinal space, into the burger space, and then it could be causing fluid misdirection. And that was my uh, thinking process at that moment. I waited for maybe about eight to 10 minutes before uh, venturing into uh, doing a parasthana tap. So my idea was just to make a parasthana incision and see how the eye is going to behave. So uh, I just waited for... Uh, these are the two diagnoses again, which I was thinking. And I was thinking fluid misdirection because of the initial diagnosis, which was there. And also, uh, I had thought that the fluid had escaped transzonularly across the fluid. The dye which I had used, the BSS which I had used to uh, wash it, and also the probably the viscoelastic as well. So I am doing a peritomy here. And about uh, three and a half millimeter posterior to the limbus, I using my uh, regular MVR blade, which I use for my side port. I'm just aim is to just make an, uh, an incision. There's no plan to do a parasthana vitrectomy here. The goal is just to make a small incision and then see what happens here. So this is a parasthana tap, which I'm trying to do here. And because the fluid, which was stained, you know, it was very easy for me because because the trepan blue stained the fluid uh, aggresses out here. So, so that was, and uh, visibility was easy. And also for me, a diagnosis was easy. Just decompress the posterior lip a little bit for it to come out. And then after maybe a couple of minutes, I go back and uh, form the chamber and the chamber now forms. And uh, it is not so hard anywhere. I could introduce my forceps quite easily and the rest of the surgery could be done quite easily. So I had got two scenarios where I aborted one case uh, and the second where I just made a pastana tap uh, and then uh, the uh, issue was handled a little bit better. Uh, but I was lucky that in most of the situations it was a uh, fluid misdirection syndrome and not a supracoronal uh, space. Uh, the fluid just gets into uh, the behind the lens in the burger space it's not hydration of the vitreous. It is just that, you know, you, it is in the retrolental space, in the burger space itself. 
and that pushes the lens ice there is there from forward and you know, all the consequent uh, things and i think we should be the game plan when we have you know wait for 10 minutes uh, just block the wound and wait uh, next would be you know about the surgery shift the patient iv menitol and third option would be it's a third option maybe you can consider tapping if you're very sure about the diagnosis uh, and let me just go through a few cases here the imaginary barrier which we think that you know the zonules provide of the trans uh, zonular migration into the post segment is a myth this is a case of iris coloboma where you can clearly see that you know i'm having a blue glow because uh, the fluid has transfers into the uh, post chamber and most often they're not these are all they're not harmful they're not very serious they don't have any serious side effects you see them and, but it's an uh, impression you have to carry that it's a possibility of you know the fluid misdirection happening this was a case of pseudo exfoliation generalized zonular weakness you can see uh, the classical blue glow here but i was nothing there's no positive uh, pressure severe enough for me to abort the procedure but typically when you're trying to introduce your lens that time you see that the pc comes out very uh, anteriorly so most often they're not they are innocuous uh, it is another situation where recently i had this a excess extension and this again this is a cause for fluid misdirection here i am uh, using hpmc and when trying to put in the lens here look at the posterior capsule the posterior capsule is almost come and uh, uh, it's bulging very rapidly and i am at risk of rupturing the uh, uh, the posterior capsule again you have to form the bag using a viscoelastic otherwise i would have broken the posterior capsule these are less serious side effects because the fluid has gone behind the retrolental space through the broken uh, anterior capsule and that increases the causes of positive pressure i think uh, these are some of the cases which i had wanted to share with you uh, that's it i think saurav we can uh, go back to life yeah so i think uh, we saw two scenarios here so <laughs> i would like uh, dr nitro to comment on because uh, fluid misdirection you are doing pass plana tap as dr deepak has shown supracorneal hemorrhage whether pass plana tap should be done or not so because many people are thinking that pass plana tap should you know make everything okay so how do you first of all differentiate between fluid misdirection and supracorneal hemorrhage dr nito well i think uh, uh, well first congratulations deepak for the wonderful cases i think they illustrate very very nicely the this situation of fluid misdirection syndrome there are many ways of presentation but uh, usually it is as we saw in uh, in the video and uh, sometimes it's difficult to perceive it at once or when it's beginning or right after it, it happened but as the we try to continue the surgery uh, we 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 really know that things are different and something's wrong and so we take action to correct it or stop the surgery i'm sorry sir you asked something i missed yeah uh, no i asked how do you like differentiate between a supracorneal hemorrhage and uh, fluid misdirection on table oh yes oh yes um almost always um, as i said i have i had a few cases but uh we almost in retrospect uh, uh remembering how we we noticed that something was wrong we almost always have a, one of the two pictures in mind it's it's not uh it's not often that we have extreme doubt is it fluid misdirection or is it uh supracorneal hemorrhage almost always the case uh, uh, the way the case presents you have already an idea if it is fluid misdirection i think as we said uh, pain is a very important sign and usually patients with the supracorneal hemorrhage usually complain of pain. Uh, uh, a lot of pain even because before anything untoward you you notice and another thing is the way of presentation in supracorneal hemorrhage the anterior chamber shallows in a in a progressive way it takes some times as you try to continue with the surgery you notice that the anterior chamber is shallowing and shallowing 
until you can't get, get anything inside anymore. And in fluid misdirection, often it is a surprising thing. You just finish almost always cortical aspiration in my experience, but sometimes after doing uh, nucleus management, you withdraw the probe and then when you're going to continue, the eyes rock right instantly. You say, what happened? And then you notice that the eye is, uh, uh, is uh, the anterior chamber is completely shallow. So most of the times you can differentiate that. If at the table or at the moment you missed all, you missed all these signs, best way or, or, uh, is to stop and wait. I usually wait for the next day. I don't try usually to, even if I'm strongly uh, inclined to think it is fluid misdirection, <coughs> sorry, I don't, uh, I, I don't do anything on the same day. I do uh, some measures, sometimes manitol, if I really think it's uh, fluid misdirection and I've done nothing before. But in the next day, you almost always are able, is able to uh, differentiate and do ultrasound or wait a little more. And now I don't know if it's the time for me to say that. Don't be afraid to let the eye with an unfinished surgery for a few days. I have done that many times, sometimes up to a week or, or 12 days. And uh, with a, let's say, have managed nucleus or cortex there, you have to manage interocular pressure, ocular inflammation, but there is no big issue. It's surprising how the eye copes with that in a, in a very nice way. It's better to wait a, a little so that you can uh, uh, restart your surgery or operate again in a safer uh, uh, eye environment, let's say like that. I think that's perfect. So that's one of the important messages from this meeting. I think don't be worried about, you know, making a procedure two step. Many times, you know, if you consider any other medical faculty apart from ophthalmology, many of them have two steps, three step procedures, you know, they start off with one, then after a few days, they go for the another. So I think we should, uh, you know, for young surgeons, we should uh, keep it away from the, our mind that I need to finish this surgery on the same day. These are the circumstances where you can always do it in a two-step manner. You can explain to the patient that I have done the first step, but I think your eye is not ready for the next step. Let's wait for some time for eye to, you know, quieten, and then we can go ahead with the next step. I think wonderful message. Okay. Uh, Dr. Deepak, uh, Dr. Sunil, you would like to add something? Uh, I will prepare the next video by the time. No, I just want to continue on what Dr. Nato said. Don't be afraid to leave the nucleus, leave the cortex. If you just take it one, you know, if you take um, uh, another situation, when you see so many traumas, you know, they're open, the capsule is open, everything is open. You try to rush in, you go and make a mess, you wait for a few days, let the eye quieten. It is so easy to handle these traumatic cataracts. So easy. In fact, the you know the tear it fibroses and you can use it like a capsular excess. And it's it's in fact sometimes even simpler than doing a normal case. So there is no harm in waiting. The only problem is we always, as I keep telling, we overthink. We are always wondering what to tell the relatives, what to tell the patient that we are going to take you back. I'm sure they will understand. It's in their best interest. So I think, yes, abandoning surgery is good. Deepak's videos, I mean, always excellent. His, um, his documentation, the way he uh, discusses and the, you know, the clarity, amazing. Really, really good, as is NATO. I am always trying to reach their, their level of presentation. <laughs> that is my, my goal. <laughs> yes. Hopefully and, I'll uh, get there sometime. Yeah, there is yeah. one question. I think that's very practical question. Why not uh, check the fundus on table? So has anybody done that? It's easily said, but, uh, you know, doing, you know, that on table, uh, any, any thoughts about that? 
I think you can very well do it. There's logistical reason because uh, in a long list, I am I want to do the next case or something. So if you have colleagues to do the job for you, ask the colleagues to do the job mm -hmm. for them. Ask them to come to the OR and do the job. Otherwise, if you are a single surgeon, there is absolutely no harm. You can go ahead and uh, do an indirect ophthalmoscopy there on the table itself. It's justified. Okay. So, uh, rest of the questions we will take later. So, we'll move on to the next uh, video. Okay, uh, I think uh, this video is from our uh, competition. This was presented by Dr. Gadre. Very interesting mm -hmm. case managed very well by him. And uh, I would like to, I, I will just check if he's uh, there. So he can also present it, but I will play the video so that all of us can just uh, have a look at it and then we can discuss it further. Uh, yeah. 36 years female with chronic angle closure glaucoma undergone YAC peripheral arytomy elsewhere twice and on two anti-glaucoma medication intolerant to acetazolamide presented with left eye chronic angle closure glaucoma with cataract with intraocular pressure 48 millimeters of mercury with very shallow AC and 360 degree posterior sanity. Preoperatively visual acuity was 624. Patient was taken up for cataract plus IOL trapped with MMC. MMC was applied 0.2 milligram for 4 minutes. and cataract surgery was started. Side ports and entry was made. FECO emulsification was done with stop and chop method. 360 degree posterior sanaki were noted. FECO, emul FECO emulsification went on uneventfully. AC was completely flat. So decision was made to make a sclerotomy and anterior vitrectomy to form anterior chamber which was done. AC was formed with visco but repeatedly it was getting flattened. So some more anterior vitrectomy was done and intraocular lens was implanted uneventfully in the back. During this manure AC was well formed and there was no rise in intraocular pressure noted. 360 degree sinaiki were released with a dialer. At this point, rise in intraocular pressure was noted with again shallowing of anterior chamber. Lens was well settled. Then we proceeded for sclerotomy along with a peripheral atrectomy which was done with a blade while during doing peripheral atrectomy there was no pressure rise one can see there is no much iris prolapse and AC was well formed with a retained air but at the same time one can see white glow in the pupillary area and that's how we suspected suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Decision was made to close the wound immediately and because sclerotomy was already formed we try to drain suprachoroidal from the sclerotomy. Our, our diagnosis was correct and the fresh blood we could drain from the sclerot same sclerotomy site. While doing that, we rise intraocular pressure from the side port through the continuous irrigation which made drainage of blood from sclerotomy site. Then we have taken decision to go in because retina was seen in the retro lenticular area and so three port pass plana vitrectomy was planned because suprachoroidal was there on the temporal side we have suspected it we have made inferior sclerotomy on the infero nasal side 
when we went in our diagnosis was correct there was a large suprachoroidal hemorrhage on the temporal side which was partially drained so we have done fluid air exchange but retina was not settled so we have made a small retinotomy and done fluid air exchange one can see retina was very well settled we did laser barrage to the retinotomy site and air silicon oil exchange was done one can see retina is very well settled and on temporal side there is a shallow suprachoroidal ac was well formed postoperatively patient did well we have given systemic steroids topical steroid and cycloplegic postoperatively visual acuity was improved to 636 with iop maintained to 10 mm mercury 36 years female with chronic angle closure glaucoma undergone yak peripheral arytenoma else where twice and on two anti glaucoma medication sorobitin for acetazolamide presented with left eye chronic Sorob. angle you are muted you are muted i think very interesting Sorob. case and uh, i think few of the questions from the audience they might be uh, might be thinking of asking something differently because i think in this surgery uh, uh, surgeon started off the surgery it was already there were all the risk factors for suprachoroidal hemorrhage but as you saw in the video uh, the first diagnosis was uh, fluid misdirection that's why the you know the posterior capsule was coming up and to correct that he did the pasplana tap pasplana vitrectomy and later that led to suprachoroidal hemorrhage so one initially itself whether it was you know starting point of suprachoroidal hemorrhage and after the pars plana tap it increased other or other way it may be fluid misdirection to start with but after pars plana tap it you know became suprachoroidal hemorrhage so i think these are the things that's why there is no clear answer whether you should do pars plana tap immediately for even when you are 100% sure that it is a fluid misdirection so uh, about this i think any uh, any other points anyone like to discuss uh after looking at this case uh, i my thought process has changed i always would like to just stop and go back uh, the or i would have done pars plana tap and all about maybe 6 months back but after looking at this case Uh, Dr. Gadre did a very heroic job. He managed the supracorneal hemorrhage the first instance itself. It's extremely difficult to manage that uh, be because one of my patients who I had referred for an endothelial keratoplasty for my one of my friend, uh, we lost the eye because of supracorneal hemorrhage because uh, the surgeon was trying to do an endothelial keratoplasty. It's a pseudo fakey eye, and he thought there is a, a fluid misdirection. They went ahead and tried to do a pars plana vitrectomy. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a supracorneal hemorrhage. so the message from all this thing is from dr nito's experience dr sushi sunil's experience and everybody is i think the uh, the logic here is waiting does more good than harm the the take home message is you waiting does more good than harm being more heroic sometimes is uh, less forgiving though i should say we lost the tie big if you had waited no it would have settled down but they went ahead and did a vitrectomy for a misdiagnosis the diagnosis was thought to be fluid misdirection but in fact it was a suprachoroidal hemorrhage and the eye was lost so i think uh, dr gadre did a great job because he is also a retina surgeon so you know he uh, had all the facilities there and he immediately raised the intraocular pressure by you know putting more fluid putting the infusion and everything uh, but i think uh, it's very difficult for any other person to manage such a thing after just uh, you know you think that after pars plana tap everything is going to be fine just like dr deepak has shown in, in his beautiful video but then uh, your video may not come up on youtube because you have <laughs> you have some different issues so i think that's uh, one of the good messages from uh, this video i think dr gadre again needs a applause because i think it was a very tough case angle closure glaucoma i think similar to dr sunil's case similar things happened it happened at the end of uh, cataract that he thought that it's a fluid you know misdevi and he had to do a trap along with the cataract surgery so 
for doing trap and putting the iol he did the pass when a vitrectomy to re, uh, reduce the uh, you know increase the anterior chamber depth and then after doing trap he realized that there is a supracoronal hemorrhage and he managed it on table so that's a uh, huge thing okay so uh, before you move on to the take home messages uh, dr deepak can you just go through some of the uh, you know question answers questions which have been asked so uh, by the time i will load the take home messages Uh, yeah uh, I, think, I think there was uh, one question about peripheral iridectomy yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. i just answered that question actually i'll repeat it he was the answer is tbi i presume it is peripheral basal iridectomy would have helped to drain out the fluid no the concept you need to understand that the fluid has collected behind the lens it's in the burger space and iridectomy is not going to release that so iridectomy is work if you have a, a pupil block it's not going to help here so that is the reason iridectomy wouldn't help and dr rajesh agarwal has asked what precaution should be taken to avoid fluid misdirection see uh, we have if you have anticipated a case of fluid misdirection like you are dealing with a case of pseudo exfoliation or loose zonules probably what i would have done or i will do is i'll use a dispersive ovd like viscoat in the peripheral part of the uh, uh, bag over the anterior capsule just to prevent a sort it it acts like a barrier to prevent the migration of fluid transzonularly uh, and apart from keeping a slightly lower bottle height uh, i don't think anything else we can do and just hope for it and uh, it's going to worsen if you have got a radial extension uh, of the anterior capsule it's going to be much worse but apart from this i don't think uh, of any other uh, precautions dr nito and dr sunil if you can add anything Well, I would sure avoid uh, many times uh, decompression in the eye, or such as going in and going out with any probe, be it the phaco or uh, of the IA probe, many times because each time you enter the the, the anterior chamber and and step on the pedal, uh, most machines just release the fluid in. in in a abrupt way and this can contribute to desiccate space and uh, allow fluid to go and uh, enter the burger's space so uh, other time is to try to reduce surgical time or uh, to the time you you stay with the irrigation on in the eye in such eyes that you suspect as dr jipak said uh, pseudo foliation and so on Uh, dr deepak you have been using centurion and uh, centurion has the advantage of low iop setting for cataracts do you use it and whether it reduces the fluid uh, you know misdirection because logically it should because if you are operating at say 30 cm of bottle height there should not be any fluid going through the zonules uh, just the thought process Yeah, I don't think uh, you you don't have to have an active fluidix itself. Even if you are using an infinity machine, just bring down the bottle height. It works the same way. It it may be just ten percent or fifteen percent less efficient, but it works the same way. Even if you are using infinity, usually work around ninety five or hundred centimeters. Bring it down to fifty and uh, reduce the uh, aspiration flow rate and vacuum just a little bit to compensate for it. It will work fine. i think uh, I, i maybe i have missed but i think you talked about the heavy dispersive viscoelastic because that has been yeah. my experience as well when you uh, fill the angles yeah particularly it puts the iris down on the zonules and uh, i have found and also i think you have written in one of the answers that it reduces the fluid going through the yeah. zonules any thoughts on this so yeah that in chondritin sulfate use a viscoelastic which is chondritin sulfate not sodium alumnate so that is important so viscoat or viscoat like things using the peripheral part of the chamber so that uh, you're creating a barrier sort of a barrier which prevents the migration of the fluid back uh, yes. ultimately we don't know these are all the possibilities we are hoping perfect. that it is going to work perfect perfect yeah dr nito yes yeah just just one more important thing when you're doing hydrodissection to uh, release pressure from the anterior chamber especially yeah. if you're using high molecular weight Uh, OVDs, because if you have an anterior chamber too much fluid, the, the, when you when you inject fluid, 
it, it, it has no time to go out and fluid can go and, mm -hmm. and, and provoke a, a fluid misdirection thing. So decompress the anterior chamber before uh, um, hydro dissection. And one Actually, more point which was told to me by an experienced surgeon is that uh, for the younger surgeons, like the pupil is small and many times they do hydro dissection and the cannula is actually has gone into sulcus and pushed. So I think that also leads to immediate misdirection. And that that's what we see, see in trainees, you know, young surgeons, they don't have the sense of depth where they are injecting. And that might also lead to, uh, so for small pupil cases particularly, you know, use the iris hooks, iris retractors, see where you are actually injecting till you get experience and know the plane, right? Hey, Dr. Sunil? Small pupil and small rexus. I think it works the same. And Dr. Deepak also showed beautifully, you can see that the fluid goes into the Berger space, especially in coloboma. When you are staining, you can see how the vitreous gets stained. So if you put this chondroitin sulfate there at that area, you can actually block it. You can show you when you are doing coloboma cases, you can actually block the tripan blue from going behind by blocking it and then staining the capsule. Yes. Okay. There are a few more uh, comments I would like to read uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bai Wong. He says that any ideas of posterior capsule rexis for intra fluid misdirection? But I think the risk of uh, doing that it may lead to vitreous prolapse because the pressure is already high. And second, as we have already seen, there is a chance that there might be supracoronal hemorrhage after doing post Uh One more uh, question by Dr. Anil Shah is what to do in angle closure glaucoma? Only trap with PBI or simultaneous cataract? Like, like in this uh, case, uh, Dr. Gadre showed where there was very high pressure. So should we uh, do only trap first and then later think about cataract exercise. No, I think the decision is purely based upon the density of the cataract, the amount of glaucomatous mm -hmm. damage which you're having. It, there's no fixed answer. If you're dealing with an advanced glaucoma and also a cataract, then a combined surgery is definitely warranted. And if you don't have cataract at all, if you just have advanced glaucoma, then just do trap, take tackle the cataract later on. On the contrary, the glaucomatous damage is very less. It's just beginning. You can just remove the lens and the eye could well be settled. So different permutations and combinations are going to work here. Depends upon the, uh, the uh, advanced nature of the glaucoma and the density of the cataract. Okay, uh, this is just comment from Dr. Shaw. He says that OSHA 78D or contact lens will help in checking the fundus immediately on table. I don't have any personal experience with both the lenses. Dr. Nito, any thoughts about this? I'm sorry, Surab, I missed the question. Okay, uh, the question or the suggestion is that 70 Usher 78D or contact lens on table, you can use to check for the supracorridals intraoperatively. Oh, yes. Well, I think it may be possible, but uh, uh, most of the time you are in difficult visualization conditions such as uh, some some degree of corneal edema uh, or compromise and uh, most of the time small pupils. So I don't think if you can rule out a, a, a supracoridal hemorrhage that way, it's, it would be very nice to, to be able to do. It is possible, but I don't think that m most of the times, I don't think it's feasible because of the conditions. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so yeah, another question. Uh, Eyes with very high IOP pre-op, it is better to give peribulbar block with good ocular massage than doing topical or, uh, of course, subtenone. So, any role of preoperative ocular massage for such cases where the IOP is high? Uh, theoretically, it should be, you know, uh, helpful. There's no doubt, you know, digital massage or interior pinky ball where to keep. They used to operate in a very soft eyeball. So with modern day closed chamber techniques, we have become a little bit more, you know, brave hearts. We want to operate it a little bit higher uh, at a physiological pressure, not in a soft eye. But in high risk cases, uh, that point seems very valid. You have to learn, go back giving peribulbars and give a uh, massage and probably do it. Regarding I, the, I haven't done it actually, but it's a good yeah, point. Regarding the ocular massage, basically we are thinking of cases where even with maximum medical management, IOP was could not be 
you know brought down now how does ocular massage help we are increasing the outflow yeah. by doing the ocular massage but there is no outflow there so i don't think it will work uh, we should try let's see but uh, i have tried that in a few cases like phacomorphic glaucoma where you know it could but i think if the outflow is completely blocked i don't know how the fluid from the vitreous where it is going to get absorbed so i am not sure whether it will help with that uh but of course uh, i yeah it has to be under block uh, topical is very difficult because if the patient is moving and squeezing it's going to you know uh, be very difficult and sometimes it may lead to even expulsive hemorrhage if the patient is squeezing the eye with pain so i think that's about all so uh, i think i will share the take home messages uh, anything else uh, any of you would like to add please yeah so thank you everyone just brilliant yeah. that you have organized such a good meeting uh, sir of that's all i would want to add yeah. really good <laughs> thank you sir and let's see what you can add to even talk take home messages so the first take home message i think uh, what we said is that recognize early and uh, particularly for suprachoroidal hemorrhage i think pain was emphasized uh, again and again if the patient is having certain amount of pain don't just disregard it Uh, and uh, recognize the raised intraocular pressure very early recognize the vitreous surge or vitreous is pushing the anterior uh, posterior capsule that you should and then pause when there is a rock hard eye i think that was one of the take home messages wait and take the patient next up for the further management now if it is due to aqueous misdirection then you can go ahead after iop is well under control as a next step and if it is due to suprachoroidal hemorrhage then i think it is better to wait like uh, for maybe 10 to 14 days of course it depends on case to case because if the pressures are going to be very high i think we may have to take a decision to you know go in early but with the uh, all the risk factors which are associated so these were the few points i would like to add but of course uh, you can uh, give a last uh, uh, take home messages from the uh, different videos we saw different scenarios and we know that each case will be different of course you make you know face a case which may not fall even in these criteria so uh, any last take home message uh, dr nito you would like to add well i think everything was very well covered and i congratulate all the participants because it was a wonderful meeting i think it's a very difficult subject to get experience so it's very important that we all share our collective experience and learn from each other so i congratulate you uh, i congratulate you and deepak for the uh, uh, wonderful meeting that you provided us thank you dr nito and uh, thank you for spending some precious time with us because i think when we see one case you see similar 20 cases that's the volume of surgeries you do <laughs> so we'll keep on you know asking you to share all your thoughts all your you know tricks and i know that you are uh, open to share all your tricks so uh, thank you so much for being here dr sunil thank you uh yeah you know you have actually picked on a topic this was actually described some way back in 1867 it's taken 150 years and we still haven't understood it and <laughs> you have picked up such a topic and really there are if you actually go into the literature there are tons and tons of theories tons and tons but you know you have made it so practical you know there's no point you can go on debating about theories what does it help but you have made it so practical and what you have to do when you are faced with situation as i have been faced with it and it's a learning experience for me as well yeah. you know i don't get 20 cases like nato as you said <laughs> i get <laughs> once or twice in my lifetime but you know it's a very good learning experience i am sure most of the people would have appreciated this and thank you so much dr thanks Sunil. both to saurabh and deepak Yeah. No, thank you, Dr. Nito and uh, Dr. Sunil, for sparing your time, and uh, we were uh, enriched by your experience. And thank you, Sunil, for sharing your wonderful case. Because uh, we, uh, by learning from our mistakes, you know, others' mistake really is going to enrich uh, our uh, surgical experience. And many of us can avoid the same mistakes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nito, for spending your time, valuable time, and your experience.
and uh, i think dr sunil you are you know i would call it a movie because it had everything you know the drama the suspense and then the difficulties and happy ending everything yeah. so i think it was a wonderful <laughs> script and uh, i loved it personally i think you have helped my patients by uh, you know showing that video i am sure many other patients who might end up with you know such situation will be helped because uh, you shared your experience with all of us so thank you so much we are so grateful for your you know you shared that particular video and uh, thank you for all the delegates participants who were actively participated in this and we are grateful to them and if there are any questions also any... because uh, he also shared a very wonderful video in this session. yes yes gadre yeah dr gadre yes thank you so much so, so we we'll meet again maybe next time right. with another topic thank you everyone yes. all the attendees from the zoom as well as from youtube bye bye thank you so much good bye. thank you bye, bye. night Have a great bye. day thank you good night i think neto is going back to the theater yes as I usual <laughs> yeah <laughs> 600